Hi everyone, uh, my name is Joe, as you can see. I'm a PhD student in biomedical engineering. I work uh, mostly with stem cells and kind of like study their behavior, taking a lot of microscope images and doing most of my analysis in Python. And kind of what I will be going through this morning is an introduction to some of the concepts of using programming language instead of a spreadsheet software. And uh, what is this like communicating with a computer with text instead of point and click? And we will also talk about uh, doing a little bit how a typical workflow will look when using this environment that we're going to teach you. And uh, then after the break, we'll go through some spreadsheets, do's and don'ts, because although we want to be as much as possible in something like Python and R, it's usually inevitable that you have to spend some of your time maybe recording your data in spreadsheets. So we want to cover that and kind of some general concepts around data. Uh, so I guess um, let's make this a bit bigger. So I guess we kind of uh, went over that. Before I start, how many here have ever used a programming language before to do data analysis? That's again an idea. A few people, but most are not. That's excellent because it's a big and we'll cover everything you need to know. Don't worry. Uh, yeah. So to start out, before we get into the actual analysis, I'll leave this up for a while and uh, kind of talk about how people communicate with computers. So essentially, the idea is that we somehow want to express our thoughts to the computer, so the com computer can modulate these flows of current and can do some advanced calculation that. Uh, it's, it's too much for us to do ourselves. So very early on, the way you did this was that you actually took a wire in one place on the computer, disconnected it, and connected it somewhere else. Luckily, we have much more advanced interfaces than that now. And what most of you use right now is some kind of graphical operating system, be it Windows or Mac OS or some type of Linux, where you can point and click to send instructions to the computer that the computer interprets, modulates, modulates these flows of current, and kind of presents you with an output. Uh, whether that is a calculation or, you know, coloring a uh, spreadsheet shell, set, cell in a specific color or launch, launching an application, it's kind of the same concept for all of that. And you can think of this graphical interface as kind of a layer or a shell around the internals of a computer. And the aim of this shell is to make it easy for you to communicate and for the com computer to understand you. And usually, uh, the program most people are familiar with when they're doing data analysis is something like Microsoft Excel, Google Sheets, uh, or maybe LibreOffice Calc, like some kind of spreadsheet software. Uh, and the, I mean, as most of you probably know, the general idea here is you have some kind of hierarchical menu system. And if you want to do some kind of analysis, you click, you know, you go to data, you do this kind of plot and that kind of. A specific function and you apply it to the data that you kind of select in your spreadsheet. Uh, kind of the our and kind of data carpentry, what we think is that spreadsheet software is great for viewing and maybe even entering small data sets. But once you get into more advanced analysis, if you want to make like publication ready figures, if you want to automate some kind of workflow, uh, or if you want to reliably clean a data set in a reproducible manner, it's not so good. And the reason to this is that a lot of what you do is point and click. And if you want to do that exactly the same way, like three months down the road, you either have to type out all your instruction, you create some kind of macro, maybe, if you're good at that. Uh, but in general, it would be easier if you just had a kind of set of instructions that you, as in a programming language, that you could just ex execute the same way you did on day one at like one year later without having to remember anything. And that's what, we'll, what is what we will teach you uh, here today. Uh, so today we'll teach you about communicating with a computer by text rather than graphical point and click. And uh, it might seem counterintuitive because we have really nice graphical interfaces today, but you'll see that it's actually more powerful. And once you get into it, uh, it's not as intimidating because you'll kind of get familiar with it. And in the end, 
uh, it's both faster and actually easier, easier to use. At least that's my opinion and the opinion of many people who kind of uh, do these kind of things. For me, it helps to compare it to learning a language uh, because in a language, in the beginning, I usually appreciate if I have like a dictionary next to me or something where I can look up every individual word I need to know and then I can string those words together and create a sentence. And that would be, you know, I go to the data menu because I don't know exactly what I want, but it's something to do with data, or I go to the file menu and it's something I want to do there. But once I become proficient in that language, it would be easier for me to just like speak the sentences because I know them rather than having to go to that menu or having to look in the dictionary every time I want to say something. And that's the same idea here. Once you know what you want to do, it's faster to just type it out, the complete thing that you want to create, than to go there and then go there and then click there and then click there. And I guess by extension, uh, it would be even faster if you could just think what you wanted to do. Uh, and this is kind of in the area of brain computer interfaces and things like that that we'll not cover today, but that's interesting. Uh, text interfaces are also less resource intensive than graphical counterparts. And this means that it's easier to develop programs with text interfaces. And uh, uh, since you don't have to kind of code for that entire graphical component. Uh, I, I have created one graphical thing myself. And by my own experience, I know that it, there's a lot of things that you don't think of. And then you try to run it, and it crashes for reason X or Y. And it can be really frustrating. It's really much easier and cleaner to just create an application that's text-based. And uh, for this reason, many of the more powerful applications are only text-based. So if you want to do some advanced data analysis, some advanced machine learning, many of these things only exist in like programming languages like Python and R. So knowing how to use one programming language and that concept of communicating through computer via text will help you also transition into exactly the package you want to use, even if it's not the exact same language that you learned. Uh, another thing, I guess we already kind of mentioned it, it's easier to automate and repeat tasks. And this is uh, great for reproducibility between labs in terms of analysis. Uh, I've read papers where people have done something. I contacted the author. I've asked them, how did you get that result? And I've gotten responses like, oh, you, you go into R, or you, you open Excel, and then you take this slider, and you drag it until you get this and this and this. And it's very like hand wavy what they actually did. And they're not open with it. If you do all your analysis in text, and you submit that code at, with your paper, it will be much easier for people reading your paper or your collaborators to actually reproduce your analysis later on. And here's a good place to mention that the, your most common collaborator is a future version of yourself. So it's in your own interest to have a really good kind of reproducible process in the analysis you create. Because in the end, it will give you less work. Um, as a final note, if you get into doing uh, more powerful analysis on like clusters of computers, this will almost never come with a graphical interface. You will log in remotely via some kind of terminal, and you have to know your way around uh, typing and communicating with a computer via text. We have a, another workshop that is centered around things like uh, more like that, like communicating on remote computers and stuff. It's called software carpentry. And uh, we'll maybe mention in the end where the next iteration of that is. But today, we're focusing on data analysis via a text interface. And specifically today, we're going to talk about Python. So to communicate to the computer via Python, the first thing we need to use to have is a Python interpreter. Uh, this piece of software will, will interpret what you type and kind of explain it to the computer so that it knows what instructions to actually execute. And to uh, launch your Python interpreter, like in its simplest form, what you do is if you're in Windows, you open something called the Anaconda prompt. And you can go ahead and do that now. So we'll test that the installation is working for everyone. And if you're on a Mac, you just open your uh, terminal. And after you've, which is called terminal.app, I think. And if you search for it in Spotlight, it should show up. And after you've done that, if you just type in Python, I'll do the same thing. So if I open my terminal, I type in Python. Wait, let me let me clear that. If you type in Python, let's make it bigger. You should see something like this. And just to test our sticker system, if you were able to go into your terminal, 
open Python, get a message like that, and then this little blinking thing. Put up your yellow sticky so that we can see. If something went wrong, please put up your red sticky and uh, one of the helpers will come around and help you. Give everyone. Is that the prompt? Yeah, if you're on Windows, it's Anaconda prompt. We'll give everyone a minute to do that. I'll wait until everyone has one sticky up. So just a few more. I mean, someone's going to put your hands on there, you can do them here. So it's sort of strange. She put her speech on the phone, which we are still in the past, just like my thoughts. But is this kind of fun for the. That was another good report. This one looks like you can find the best. It's the end prompt. That's not the evil tax. That's why. Can you go here? So usually it doesn't kind of do anaconda prompt. So it's just. Anaconda prompt. And it should be able The reason is it doesn't register the command line from where default. The cache also can be installation. Yeah, it's some, yeah, exactly. It doesn't put itself in the path unless you pass it up. Okay, it seems like everyone has got a link now, so uh, let's kind of proceed. One thing, I will call this the Python interpreter. Sometimes I'll call this the Python prompt. The reason for that is It's the digital cursor, it's like blinking and it's prompting you to enter a command. So you'll hear both those, can that terminology, uh, Python prompt or Python interpreter. So uh, when you think of English and other spoken languages, they're usually referred to as what's called natural languages. Python, on the other hand, is called a formal language. And kind of, uh, you might think it's tricky to learn a formal language because it's computer based. It's actually not. I kind of prefer it over learning a natural language. And you also probably already know one formal language, which is mathematics, which you have some kind of perception of how it works. And the good thing is that a lot of the things you learn in mathematics are actually typed the exact same way in the Python interpreter. A little bit like, if you want, you can use it as a big fancy calculator. So if you type something like 4 plus 5, and you hit Enter, you'll immediately get the output just below that row. Row. Uh, so, and the fact that Python just gives you the output right back is another one of the strengths with the language, and one of the reasons why we choose it to do data analysis. In some languages, what you have to do is, when you've typed out your instructions, you have to kind of do an extra manual step, where you compile these instructions into what's called machine code, and then the machine can execute that code very fastly, very fast, but, uh, you will have to go through this step, extra step, every time you do some minor change. 
in languages such as Python and R, which are interpreted, when we do a change, we'll see the, we can see the results right away without any extra uh, time spent modifying the code. And this is great because usually most of the time that we spend when we do data analysis and explore, especially exploratory data analysis, is that we kind of we try to do some kind of plot, we do some kind of calculation, then we want to change a small thing or we want to change some colors or something, and we want to get that output back right away. So that's a, a strength of an interpreted language. Uh, another strength of this kind of sparseness is that, like just in math, we only have to type four plus five. We don't have to type some kind of long sentence like, hello computer, can you please add four and five for me and return the result? And I mean, that kind of is a given that that's more, much more efficient. Uh, but importantly, it also reduces ambiguity in the language. So when you have a natural language that is spoken, there's a lot of ambiguity and you, people can misunderstand each other and a lot of the things come from context. In formal languages, there's as little ambiguity as possible and usually there's only a few ways of doing something. Importantly, the computer or the Python interpreter will tell you if you do something wrong right away. So you'll get that result back. If I do an illegal operation, I'll get an error and we'll talk a little bit more about how those look later. Uh, I personally, uh, so if you haven't heard it already, I'm not a native English speaker. For me, I actually think it's a relief to learn formal languages because there's always, like when I look up why something is done a certain way, there's always a logical and clear explanation to why that happened. It's not like in languages like English or French or my native language Swedish, where the answer to that question could be like, that's just how it is. And you have to memorize it. I, I don't know, for me, it's a, uh, that's, it's just really nice to understand why something is done a certain way. And there are few, if any, edge cases where you have to just memorize something because historically that's how it is. Okay, so let's do a few more commands. So other things we could do, we could do what's called variable assignment. I should have asked in the beginning. Everyone in the back, can you see, is this a good font size or do you want it even bigger? I don't think you should go bigger because I was not able to see that. Bigger, a little bit bigger. I got some thumbs up also, so we'll do a little bit bigger. Like that. If you can't see at some point, just raise your hand and uh, I'll fix that somehow. If I do this, I have a question. Yeah. Um, you know how you did that operation for? It doesn't. What What does it say? Oh yeah, he will help you. Uh, if you have questions throughout, just raise your hand and ask. If it's like a helper question, just put up a sticky and they'll be over as quickly as possible. So if I do this, I'll get no output back. But now the value five, I've kind of stored it in the variable A or given it the nickname A. So if I ever want to access that variable, I can use A and it'll print out five. And likewise, I can do operations uh, on A just as if it would have been an operation on that number. And now I'm just going to do something so that the prompt doesn't go off screen. Don't mind this. Uh, ignore this lower part, it's just to keep this up here. Uh, da, da, da. And in my experience, the reason I did this analogy with uh, this comparison between natural and formal languages is also that I think learning a formal language is a lot like learning a natural language in the sense that you'll get the most out of it and learn the quickest if you keep trying to speak as much as possible with a computer and you receive that instant feedback when you do something wrong or something right. So don't read all the manual and then try to do everything perfectly. Try trial and error. Uh, do you need to have spaces between all your variables? Uh, good question. You don't. You can do something like four plus five. However, it is, there's like a style guide for how you write Python. So it's consistent between different people. And they recommend you have spaces just so that it's, uh, uh, you know, when I look at your program, you look at my program, it kind of makes sense to you right away. Okay. So this is what we talked about here, is the Python interpreter. It's super powerful, but when we're doing data analysis, we want to have like more bells and whistles. We want to have more things around it. So we're going to use a different environment that kind of bundles this at its core, but also gives you a lot of extra features. Like you can open terminals, you can view images, you can view movies if you want, you can save it in very comprehensible reports. And uh, if you exit your prompt, which you do by typing exit, and I think double parenthesis, or in the parenthesis. And now uh, you should be back at 
you should be out of the Python part and you type something like, sorry. Uh, I think you can also type it with a space. I usually do it with a hyphen. It's the same thing. So type this, press enter. Uh, should be a lot of text running in your screen and it should open a new browser tab. Which, uh, of course, it doesn't do. Yeah, okay. So you should get to something that looks like this. Sorry? Yeah. So just to repeat that. Uh, sorry. So I just type Jupyter Lab into the console and it should open. If you can't get that to open, then another way of opening this is to go to your either spotlight if you're on a Mac or the start menu, type in Anaconda Navigator, and you'll get kind of a graphical interface where you can point and click to open the program you want. So you can find Jupyter Lab in that graphical interface as well. Um, yeah, so just if you were able to get a screen that looks like this in your browser, can you please put up your yellow sticky? And if you're having issues getting here, please put up your red sticky and we'll help you. Yeah. OK, uh, that's fine. You're good. Yeah. Uh, you don't want, so do you get to this screen? Yeah. Yeah. OK, that would be the, so if you're already at this screen, great. Uh, if you're not at this screen, you should press this plus button up here, which says new launcher. And then we'll go to the next. OK, yeah, do that now. Everyone who's at this screen, keep your yellow sticky up. If you're not at this screen, put a red sticky up. And we can help you get there. Who's attending a webinar at the same time as we're having this lecture? <laughs> Okay, it looks like everyone is uh, done pretty much. So as was pointed out earlier, there are a few things here that we can do. Uh, if we launch this console, we'll get kind of the same interface we had before. So an interpreter, a prompt, a console, they're all the same thing. Uh, the bash console is more for navigating your operating system. Maybe I'll show you that briefly later. Uh, uh, sorry, that's a terminal. And then you have a normal text editor. What we'll do now is we'll open a notebook in the Python 3 language. So you click this icon here. Uh, if that isn't, OK. And on your left side, you'll have different tabs. I'm just going to minimize my file tab for now, so it's easier for you to see. And we can also do that. We can do that. And in the back, if you can't see what I'm typing, let me know. So, can you see what I'm typing? No. <laughs> Good, thank you. Can you see what I'm typing? Excellent. So, this, if I, uh, this is very much the same as what we had before, in that if I execute this statement, 
which here instead of enter, I do uh, shift enter or control enter. Uh, you'll see that the output comes out right under it, exactly the same way as we did before. So this part you can think of as the the the, the black Python interpreter part that we saw before. Um, but the the notebook does a lot of more things. So first, I guess I should say that um, this idea of embedding kind of the uh, prompt into this extra interface uh, is to make it more interactive. And it initially came from an initiative called IPython, which only focused on interactive Python. It's now called Jupyter because it kind of grew and it now involves a lot of more languages. So it's it's Julia, which is language, Python, uh, R, and more. There, uh, I'm not going to go through all the languages that are included, but those are kind of the core languages, and that's where the name comes from. I'll try to explain names as we go on, because I like remembering by knowing what the name means, because every time I think of the name, I also recall kind of why, why it's named that way, and then that helps me memorize. Um, do, do, do. And the idea, or well, the dimension of this interface is that it's both easier for you to do interactive analysis, and it's easier for you to create reports that are very, that are shareable. So do you have a question? No. Uh, so we create a new notebook. And we can also see, OK, I should have opened a new folder. So my notebook is called Untitled 22, which means I have 21 other of these. Uh, for you, it should just say Untitled. I um, guess the first thing you might want to do is change the name. So if you go to File and Rename Notebook, let me know if I ever block you, too. If I block you, let me know, and I'll try to like get out of the way. If you go to Rename Notebook, and you can just call it something more uh, appropriate. So we can call it U of T, whatever you want. U of T coders, uh, Python intro. And that changed the name there. If you go to your Files tab, and if you find this, uh, should have created a new one. If you find this file here in your file tab, you'll see that it's also updated the, the name. So you actually changed the name of that file now, which is also the title of your notebook. Uh, let's close that again. And let's get back to this. So what I just showed you here is what's called an input cell. So this is like one restricted area of the notebook where you get your input. And you can see it's this little blue thing is kind of uh, noting that. And then there's a gap. And then there's your output cell. You can collapse output cells. You can collapse input cells. If there's some part of your analysis where you're like, OK, I don't need to see that right now. It's just collapsed. Uh, exactly like, so if you want to create a new cell, we can either press Shift Enter, which will run the current cell and create a new cell. Or we can go up here again. We can press this little, little uh, play button, which says run the selected cell and go to the next one. And if the next one wouldn't have existed, it would have created a new cell. Uh, we can also, I guess that's the most common way you will uh, create cells. But just for reference, you can also go to, uh, wait. Sorry, I always do this through uh, shortcut commands. I actually don't know. Oh, sorry, you can also go here and say, like, insert a new cell below the current cell if you just want to have more of this. And we can do exactly what we did before. So if you type A equals 5, you'll have no output. And then you check what A is. You'll see, OK, A is 5. I can do an operation on A, A times 2, exactly the same thing as we were typing in things before. So in terms of shortcuts, I guess I should just repeat that one more time. If you want to stay on the same cell, you type Control Enter. Uh, you execute it, and you stay there. If you want to execute and go to the next one, you press Shift Enter. So for those people who like shortcuts, you can also press the Play button. Totally up to you. Uh, one thing you'll see that there's a little counter here on the left. So in this input cell, it's 3, 4, 8, 6. And that's just for you to keep track of in which order you've executed these cells. Because what I did now, for example, I, I executed that one, then that one, then that one, and then I went up there again. And I can, I can try trace that back by that number, which is useful when you get into really long documents. And if I ever wanted to create like a report, and I kind of was, OK, I just want to run through my entire notebook, you can go to Run, and you can say, 
uh, restart kernel and run all cells. We'll basically like, I can give you a warning, say restart, and I'll be one, two, three, four, five. So we'll like, it will restart Python for you and just run through everything so you know that if you give this to someone else and they do it from um, a new instance of this, it will work because it works for you when you do it. Uh, this, the notebook is saved automatically. If you is as paranoid as I am, <laughs> you can also go and press this button occasionally or control S, the SSC you would do in a, in a Word document. Uh, yes, talk about that. One other thing I want to mention about the general formatting of this. So I said that this kind of has more functionality than your default Python prompt. One of those things that I found is really useful is um, if we, okay, let's just go here, create a new cell, and say I want to type some notes to myself about what I did there. What I could do here is to go to this little menu, which now says code, and I can go and say that instead of formatting this cell as a code cell, I want to format it as a markdown cell. How many have heard of markdown before? Not too many. So it's, luckily, it's, it's pretty straightforward. Markdown is text. So it's plain text, and there are some special like decorators that can give your text uh, additional functionality, like make something bold, or make something in italics, et cetera. If you have ever typed in online forums, or if you have WhatsApp installed, you might have used this already, and the same syntax uh, works in these applications as here. So now I can make a note to myself. Uh, it'll be a redundant note in this case, but I can say that, OK, uh, I assign the value to A. And if I press Shift Enter here, it will go to next cell as before, and it will give me this little note uh, in line in my notebook together with my code. The alternative to this is that you kind of keep a separate file, text file, with your notes, and then you have your codes in another file, and then when you create your figures, you have those images in some other locations on your file system. That becomes very messy, and it's, it's very nice to have it all in one kind of document. Um, just before we move on, I'll give a few examples of the syntax in Markdown, and then you can use it as a reference. We also have a link in the uh, lecture files, which you can go back to, and you can check the syntax. But we'll do a few things here just so you get an idea. So, okay, if I go to this cell and I say, okay, let's make a new one. I want it to be Markdown. So I can do things like create a heading, and you'll see that the the notebook is already helpful in that it, it will make this like bold and blue already when I'm typing it. So say I make a heading, I press enter to go down here. I want to create the bullet point. And I want to make, I uh, want to emphasize this. And I want to strongly, there will be lots of misspellings, uh, strongly emphasize this. I execute this now by pressing, say, Shift Enter. You can see that it actually formatted it kind of like a word processor would format it. And I'll bring that back up. So it was two bullets. You can do hyphens, or you can use asterisks. For um, <coughs> emphasis, you can use either a single star or a single underscore. And to strongly emphasize or make something bold in bold font, you can use uh, a double asterisk or double underscore. And you can also create links and stuff. And you can see we, in the lecture sheet, we have actually created a link here to um, a resource where you can learn more about Markdown. And we'll distribute those later. I'll leave it up just a little bit so everyone can type it in. So um, this notebook, the way we see it in this really nice graphical interface, the way it's stored on the computer is as a text file in a special format called JSON. All, you don't have to learn exactly how that works. It's just a text file with a structure that makes it really easy to take this notebook file into someone else's, browse, uh, someone else's machine and then run it there. Uh, in general, storing things as text files is great for kind of long-term viability and also uh, for uh, interchange and sharing between different systems. And so, okay, execute this. Say we want to give this to someone that doesn't have Python installed. 
then we can't send them that text file because they still need Python installed to run it. But what we could do is we could generate a report from this. So if I go to File and Export Notebook as, I get all these options. So we could do Markdown, as we just learned about. This representation we are seeing here uh, is HTML, which that's why we're running it in our browser, because the browser knows how to interpret HTML. And more commonly, what I do if I send this to my supervisor, uh, I go PDF, and I say, OK, I want to create a PDF file of this. And it goes and says, OK, I create this PDF file. You're automatically downloading it. You want to save it. We can just open it for now. You guys should see. And then you get something like this. So you get your title, today's date. Uh, if you go down, you'll see that, OK, I executed the cells. Here are my headings. And I mean, this is just a normal PDF file. You can send it out to, uh, to, uh, to anyone that you want feedback on your work from. So that's really great and a fast way to get someone else's thoughts uh, without having to make them install Python themselves. Although ideally, everyone would have Python installed, but that's not the case right now. Do, do, do. Lastly, before we get into more data analysis stuff, uh, I wanted to mention more about this different format. Hey, how's it going? Yeah. Oh. Does it prompt you to install it? Or just an error? OK, let's look at that in the break, maybe. Um, sorry, I forgot about that because I have it installed. We'll look at that in the break. So if I close this and I go back here, um, as I, so I'll make this a little bit smaller. As I mentioned before, when we were in the, in the initial prompt, was that you can open more things than notebooks. So if I go to File, New, I can select many different things here. So say I want to edit a text file, and uh, at the same time as I'm editing my notebook, because maybe I'm writing down some, some like general thoughts that just pop into my head that I want to get rid of. You get this, and it's, this is just a normal text format. You created a file called untitled.txt. You can just take notes here. If you want to take notes side to side where you're doing your input, you can drag this tab. And you can just drag it to the right side. And now you have the text file there, and you can do your analysis here. Um, you could also create what's called a terminal. If you go to new file new terminal, you'll get uh, sorry, I always get that error. Just get it. You can drag this down here. Now you have this. You can like you can design this however you want. Uh, this is a normal way of. You'll see some interfaces like MATLAB, R Studio, uh, PyCharm, Spider, where they kind of have this multi-tab layout. If you like that, it's totally possible to do in Jupyter Notebook. The advantage is that you can do some like. Say you create some external image that you don't want to uh, show in here. You can like, OK, I'll open it from my terminal because I am in the same folder. And up here, I'll take my notes while I'm doing my analysis. For me personally, I, I don't really have this, this to open that much. Uh, sometimes I have the text document open, depending on what I do. Usually, I work with this in full screen. And I have a, another thing on the right side I'll talk more about later. Uh, finally, if Oh, uh, before I, OK. If you go to the, so on the right here, this is the end of the introduction. Uh, you have these different tabs, files, just your file system. Running is everything you have going on right now. We have that notebook, and we just open one of the terminals as well. We don't need a terminal. We can shut it down. Uh, commands, very useful. If you forget something, you can just like browse through this list. And, and uh, you'll find everything you can do. Like what we were doing before, change between code cell and markdown cell. There are actually shortcuts that are also displayed here, like control one to change the code, control two to change the markdown. And you can even search this, and you're like, OK, what, what was that markdown command? And you'll say, OK, these are the markdown commands that you can use. Uh, you don't have to care about cells to, cell tools for now. Tabs is essentially just the same thing you have there. So not that important either. OK, so that kind of wraps up the introduction to this interface that we'll use today. And you may be, OK, that was a lot from just an interface. 
but it will become very intuitive as you keep using it and as you keep getting used to it. Now I will do, we'll go through a brief workflow of how to do data analysis in Python, kind of from the very beginning of reading in a file, making some kind of operation, and then doing some kind of figure or plot. And this will be more of a high level overview so that you get an idea of what this looks like. Then throughout the, the afternoon session and tomorrow, we'll go into different details of this workflow um, or different sections in much more detail, and you'll actually like get all the all the nitty gritty of it. Sorry, do you need help? Are you good? Okay. Can, can one of you guys? Yes. Cool. Okay. So when you're doing, say you want to open a file in this interface, what you would do if you were using a spreadsheet program is that you would go to some kind of menu. You go like file, okay, I want to open a file. And then you would find like your data file. Say you're in Excel, you want to open a CSV file or your XLS file. You would navigate through a menu and open it. Um, in Python, there's a similar, okay, let me create some new of this. There's a similar idea, but instead of, as we said, instead of doing point and click, we're going to type things in. So instead of clicking file open, the, the concept of what we do in Python, you don't have to type this in, it's doing something like file open, and then we do like the, the path to our file here. Now, so this is not the exact command, but this is the idea of how it works. So whenever you see these things, you can think of, okay, I'm going into that menu, then I'm clicking that thing, and then I'm just giving it this argument that I would normally select graphically. Um, and so to do, um, since Python is not a language only for data analysis, but a general purpose programming language, there's a lot of things you can do with Python. You can do anything from creating websites, databases, you can do data analysis, you can create GUIs, everything. And because of this, the way Python is designed is that there's a core of features that you will always get when you install Python. Like we can always do mathematics when we install Python. Four plus five will work in any Python installation you have. Uh, but some of the other things that are more specialized, um, they kind of reside in, in uh, separate packages that you need to download and install and then activate. And you can think of that as, you know, you have your browser or even you have your phone. Your phone doesn't come with every single app installed when you buy it. You use the apps you want to use. And since we're using the Anaconda installation, uh, which was the one we had in the instructions, essentially what that is is that the organization Anaconda took these packages that are often used for data analysis and they bundled them together with a Python interpreter and they're like shipping that as one install. So you have already installed most of the packages you need to do data analysis, but we still need to kind of activate them in this interface and say that we want to use that package now. The way we do that, for example, if I want to use the numerical Python package, uh, I, I say, okay, I want to import the numerical Python package. The name of that package is NumPy. Can you see in the back? Let's do this, just to be sure. Let's do that. And uh, that, yes. If I say import NumPy, it should just, it should run. You can see when this cell is uh, running, you'll see, uh, you can, you'll briefly see that this changes to an asterisk when it's thinking. And when it's done, it'll be a number. So if there's a number there and you get no output, it ran successfully. And if I do import NumPy, uh, I now have access to all the functions within NumPy. So that's like, instead of clicking the NumPy menu, and I, I now type, okay, NumPy, and say I want to uh, calculate the mean of some numbers, I do NumPy mean. And then um, we'll talk more about this later. This mean here is called a function, and normally the syntax for function is to open a parenthesis like that, and then you type in the, the numbers you want to type. So I need to give it numbers in a square bracket, will I explain in a second. You do something like this, and you should actually have spaces there. I should do it correctly. If you then run this, you'll get the output that you expect. I'm gonna try to keep this as high up as possible, just so everyone can see it. If I'm scrolling past something too fast, just stop me and I'll go back. If that did not work for you, put up a red sticky. Okay, it seems to work for uh, everyone. 
The, the initial thing now is maybe, okay, how do I know all these things I can do? Maybe it makes sense that mean is one, but what else is there? Luckily, you don't have to remember this. You can just do numpy and you do dot. If you press tab now, you actually get, so that was, you do a period and then you press tab after. Now you get every single function there is in this package. So this is the, what would be the same as if this would all be in a menu and you opened it, you would see all this. Since that's kind of too much, because you don't want to scroll through everything of this, it's good to have an idea of what you want to do. So say I want to take the median instead of the mean. I can start you know, typing the first characters, and this will update. Oops. So now you have everything signed with ME, and even where ME is found inside the word if it doesn't start with it. So if you do median, and then you could copy this thing from up here. I mean, we'll get the same re response in this case. But the exact same syntax of how to use it, you can find the functions by pressing tab and kind of getting that automatically or automatic completion. Um, okay, so if we go to a new cell, sorry, sometimes my mouse dies or my touchpad dies, so to restart it, there we go. Okay, so if I go, we, we'll do the mean function again, because I want to show you something else. If I do that first uh, bracket, and then you press tab, you'll get a list of all the arguments you can pass here. Like, you get a list of all the options that this function can take, and we'll get into that in much more detail later. I just want to mention how you can access these help things from this interface. Uh, another way here is to press shift tab, which will get you like a documentation of what this function does. And it kind of makes sense. Sorry, it shouldn't be in the real way. It says, OK, we, this function mean will compute the arithmetic mean uh, along the specified axis, which is not important for now. Uh, and then there's like a little description. And you can scroll down and it says that, OK, this first argument that we pass needs to be an array-like argument. You already seen one example of that, which is enclosing in square brackets some numbers. That's something that's array-like. It's called a list. Get into that more later as well. And here, I want to mention the, remember before when I said usually I have something on my right side when I program? What I have there is called the object inspector or just inspector. If you go to commands, you type in inspector. Let's say that, okay, I can open inspector, control I, or just press it here. Uh, so. and then I can drag this to my right side. And I'm just going to make this smaller for a short time. And what will happen now is that as I type something, it will automatically show there what I can do with this function. This is super powerful. I will not have this open now just so you can see this well because I'm going to have it uh, zoomed in so much. I recommend that you have this open all the time on the side because it will give you help as you type. And it's something I use myself when I, do, when I, when I, when I, when I sit and do my own uh, data analysis. Sorry, how you open it? Yeah, so you go to commands and you just type in inspector. And you say open inspector. The shortcut is control I. And then you'll get that in a separate tab, tab, you, tab you drag that tab to your right. Do, do, do. Okay. So we'll wait for a few people to so everyone is on the same page. Yeah. Yeah. 
And then you get that set. And you can have to practice that now. Okay. See? And now you have a nice set of Maybe you want to have like this. If you full screen that also, you can have a full Okay, it looks like most people are ready. So, um, uh, by convention, many of these packages are, instead of doing uh, import NumPy, and then typing out NumPy every time I want to get something, it's common to give the package a, a kind of a nickname that's sh shorter, just to save yourself some keystrokes. So you say something like, hey, I want to import NumPy, and I want to import it as NP. So from now on, and it will do this throughout, so this is just a convention to get used to. If I want to take the mean of something now, I have to NP mean, and like everything else is the exact same as before. I, I can show that. One, two, three. That works exactly the same. So the package that uh, the package or the modu module that we'll be using for data analysis is a module called Pandas. Um, Pandas stands for panel data something. Uh, and it's a like econo econometrics term originally, because that's in the topic area in which this package was developed. And um, you can also use NumPy for numerical analysis, but Pandas is specifically for you know, when you have a spreadsheet and you want to do it in Python, then you can use Pandas. And then Pandas uses NumPy under the hood and kind of uh, does some of the formatting and things for you, so it's a little bit simpler. And by convention, we import Pandas as PD. So we do import, oops. And I should also mention that if you start typing something and you're like, hey, I don't want to make a mistake in spelling it, if you press tab, it will automatically complete that word. And that'll save you some time and make sure that your spelling is correct. And then you'll see you get that highlighting in green. Say, OK, uh, visual reinforcement, I didn't misspell it. Import pandas as PD. Um, since uh, we didn't want to distribute a data set to everyone before the workshop, we will kind of, what we will do now is that we will load the data set on, from online. So uh, normally, when you're creating something, when you work with data, it's either like measurements that you've recorded yourself in a spreadsheet, and then maybe you save it as a CSV file, or you downloaded it from the internet somewhere, or you have some instrument in your lab that spits out these text files. And the way to get them into Python, to read in a file from Python, um, using pandas is to use the function called uh, pd.read. And if you press, press the underline and press tab, we'll see that there are different files that we can read in. So you can read from the clipboard, you can read CSV, which are text files, you can read Excel, you can read some of these other formats they'll not get into. Um, but what we'll do now is to use read CSV. And when you do that first parenthesis, or even before that, you should get, sorry, information about that function on the right side in the inspector, which is similar to what I get if I press Shift Tab. This function takes a lot of different options. So it's a little, you have to like scroll down a little bit, and then you say, OK, what this does is that it reads as CSV files into data frame format. And data frame is what we're calling that two-dimensional columns and rows format when we work with it in Pandas. And now uh, there's no great way of doing this. So you'll all have to type in this URL that I'm going to type, and we're going to load data uh, from, that, from that location. So first, you need to do a single or double quote, just to say that I'm going to type in an address here. And if you can't see this, I'm bring it up there. Oh, I can also paste in the Etherpad. Then no one else has it. But now I already got them started. Uh, OK, I'll do that as well. Uh, data slash master slash iris dot csv. I'm going to try to run this to make sure it's working. It worked. I'm 
Uh, I'm now going to go paste this in the Edupad if I know how to get there. So it's pad dot software. I should have opened this before, sorry. Oh, you did it already. Okay, thank you. So uh, someone already kindly copied and pasted this in here. So that's the URL you want to use. And if you just go to the Etherpad, you can find yourself. I'll go back to the notebook. So if you type, so let's do the stickies now. If you type PD read CSV, open a parenthesis, type a, a single quote, then type in this address, and then a single quote parenthesis, you should get an output that looks like this. If you can get that output, please put up your yellow sticky. If you don't get it, put up your red sticky. Okay. You can go to the Etherpad and you can find that address. So, it looks surprisingly well. <laughs> no typos? Yeah. Um, yeah. So I things that here. just copy the link. You can go to the page. Here. Copy the link. Copy the link. Copy the link. Copy one note is that if you would put that address and put it into your browser, it would look like this. So there's actually a text file lying somewhere on some server that looks like this. And it's the names of your columns, and then there are the values, and they're all separated by comma. So this specific text file is called iris because it contains data about the, the, the leaves and the flowers of three specific iris flower species. And it, it's normally used for examples, so that's why we're using it here. Okay, so we'll move on. And you can see here that you're getting this kind of spreadsheet-like representation. You have the column names up here. You have the values for each columns, and which are numerical apart from the species column. Um, this, is, this is just as in Excel. You open a file, it shows it to you. However, when we work with it in Python, you want to give give it a name, just as we, we assign like number five to the variable A. We want to assign this to the variable iris. So if we write iris equals that, we'll store all that uh, output in that variable. Then you should get no output at all. But if you type iris in the next cell and press control enter, you should see exactly the same thing. If you have an issue, put up your red sticky. Okay, so this is kind of exciting. We've got the data into Python. We're ready to do some kind of analysis. Uh, already doing what you came here for. Um, one thing to mention, if you don't want to see everything, because this is kind of long. If you scroll down, you'll see, okay, there's a lot of output. It even skipped some rows, and then there's a lot more output. Um, we'll get into more details about this later, but just briefly to get a better overview, you can use this function head, which says only show me like the head of the data frame, which is the first five rows in this case. Like that. And what I will do now, we're almost due for a break in like 10, 15 minutes. Uh, I will show you an introduction, some of the more common thing you can do in Python that maybe in Pandas that you maybe did in Excel or Google Sheets or something before. And uh, then we'll have a, a 15 minute ish break. So say I want to work with only one column in my data set. Um, not, I want, don't want to work with everything at all at the same time. I can select that column by doing iris and then open bracket and then single quote. And then say I want to work with a column for uh, petal length. And then let's do, do this dot head after, which will do the exact same thing as here. Just show like the upper part. Scroll, I'll scroll up. Um, 
So this was the name of one of the columns in my data set. I want to select only that column. As I expected, I get, instead of getting that two-dimensional format back, I get only like a 1D array of numbers, which is only the petal length column from the data set. I'll give everyone some time to type that in. If it's not working, put up a red sticky. Yeah, you could. Um, we'll get into how to do that later because I don't want to. I just want to show a little bit of an overview of things, but you definitely could. Yeah, it, it, the syntax is a little bit different. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Say I wanted to calculate the mean value for all the columns. Um, what I would do is so this is where the advantages already start to show. Instead of doing like Excel and operation for each column where you sum everything or you take the mean of that column and the mean of that column and the mean of that column. You can type the name of the data frame, you say dot, you say mean, and then you do your parentheses. And the output, I'm gonna add some of this just so you can see it. I'll give you the mean value for every single column. It'll exclude the column that was called species, because as you remember, we only had text in that column. It was like the name of species, and it doesn't make sense to take the mean value of text. Only the numerical values are shown here. Uh, however, the species information is still interesting to us, right? So what if I want to have the mean for every species for all these things? Essentially what I want to do is I want to create groups for these species. Uh, I do iris and I say, okay, I want to group my data by species before I take the mean values. And don't worry if there's some like detail of this that does not make sense right now. This is more to introduce the concept and kind of how the data analysis workflow looks. And we'll get into details. I will get into details about those different sections later. But already here, you can see that, okay, this is a very kind of sparse syntax for getting, doing uh, operation that's like at least semi-complicated and will take a lot of time to do in a spreadsheet. Uh, so you get it for every species and for every column, you get this little uh, matrix out that says you the mean, that tells you the mean values of these things. Um, kind of what this is referred to, and we'll talk more about it later, is um, like a split, apply, combine paradigm of data analysis. And essentially what that is, is that I split my data into groups uh, I apply some kind of operation. In this case, I take the mean, and then I combine it together into this result table. Split, apply, combine. We'll learn much more about this later, um, but I, I just thought I would mention it now. Does this kind of make sense? Are there any questions to me? Is this... Can you yeah. repeat the difference between brackets, uh, square brackets and parentheses? Because I always... Okay, yeah, so I've only used square brackets so far to um, index something, like to get a column. Usually when you're indexing into something, you're like, okay, I'm gonna extract that part, you use square brackets. In functions, which is everything else we've done, it's parentheses. Again, we will talk more about that later, so you'll like uh, repeat that and get a more of a sense for it, but briefly, that's what it is. And the final thing we'll do before the break is to see um, okay, this is all nice and dandy if you want to have your results in text format. What if I want to create some kind of graph or some kind of plot? So in, for plotting in Python, the first thing we want to do uh, is that we want to tell the notebook that we want our plots to be in the notebook because the default option is just to pop them out in our window. And this is just a thing that you'll have to do every time. It's, you can also set it in your configuration file to do it automatically, but I'll do it here to show it. And that command is, as you can see, it's math.lib inline. So put my graphs inline, don't show them in a different window. And that's just a setting that makes everything show up here. To do visualizations in Python, there are some already built into to the package we just used, pandas. But there's a more powerful package, which is dedicated for statistical visualizations. And that's the one we'll use now. That package is called Seaborn. 
And it's there's no good way of remembering that name because it's a pun on some TV show character that I of a show I don't watch and don't remember the name of. But if you import it as SNS, it should change to a star and then it'll be a number. And now you could do something like, okay, say I want to count the number of observations of each species in this data frame. So you can say, okay, I want to do uh, what's called a count plot. Count plot, tab, press tab, it will automatically complete. And then we say, okay, on my x-axis, I want every single, or sorry, the three different species to be shown. And the data I want to use is this data I just created, which is called iris. And if you do that, you'll get something that looks like that. Uh, let me zoom out one, maybe. So now again, very sparse, very brief syntax. Uh, it automatically makes this plot. Not super interesting plot in this case, because we actually have 50 observations of each species in the data set. There's a total of 150 uh, rows in that data we saw before. But it's more to show how the plotting works. Let's do one more. Is it one, two more plots before we go on lunch? Um, as we saw before, if I scroll up, when we did the means of these different columns, um, for example, the, the length of these different things, you can see that they are uh, different. One way of doing that is to compare the means and the confidence intervals, etc. If you wanted to look at all the observations, it's not really feasible to do it in a text uh, representation, but we could do a plot where we have like one dot for each one of those observations. We can compare the different species. So very similar syntax as before, but instead of doing a count plot where we count everything, this specific type of plot is called a swarm plot. And again, don't worry about the details about its names. We'll get into it later. Briefly, why it's called a swarm plot, I guess, it's because people think it looks kind of like a bee swarm. You know, when you depict them, uh, they can be like, you'll see when I make the plot. Uh, and you say, again, on my x-axis, I want the species. And now you also have to say, but we're not counting, we, wanna, so we need to specify what I want to do on my y-axis. Sorry, get that down. On y, I want to uh, say, what do I do, petal length? And my data is still the iris data set. And this is the reason it's called a swarm plot, because some people think these look kind of like beehive or bee swarms. You can also call it a dot plot uh, and some other names. But now we get the same thing we looked at before. We only look at the mean values. We kind of see every single observation in that data set. Uh, I really like this type of visualization because it gives me everything there. I can look at the distribution. And maybe I'll also add the plot of the mean. And we'll see later how you can combine plots like that. And since, so the total number of plots here. So who can, do you know how many plots are there? Uh, sorry, how many dots are there in this plot? How many observations are in this data set? Yeah, exactly. So there's one dot, for, one dot for every observation. So there are a total of 150, 50 in each species. Um, that's pretty much it. The last plot I want to show is just, it might seem overwhelming, but it's just to show how easy it is to create a super informative visualization using these tools. Um, commonly, what I or many people want to do when you start analyzing the data set where you don't have really that much previous information is maybe you want to check the distribution of each variable and you want to compare pairwise relationships between variables in the data set. To check the distribution, what I can do is I do a histogram. I see like, okay, that's how those things, that's how that variable is spread out. And for pairwise relationships, you do a scatter plot where you compare one variable to another variable. Um, in Seaborn, there's this great way of doing all this with one command together. And it's called a pair plot because you check the pairwise um, pairwise relationship between variables. So if you do SNS pair plot, and all you give it is that your data is this iris data set. You don't have to specify any other things. Press control enter. I'm gonna zoom out so we can see this. Uh, and you should still see that. So uh, it's kind of here for me, but I want to keep that up there. The, so here on the diagonal is the distribution for every variable in your data set. The variable names are here. Uh, and the upper half and the lower half around that histogram is the same. It's just a mirror image of the other part. And essentially what you see here is you get 
kind of with one very short command, you get an overview of your entire data set and you can sit down and you can be like, oh, okay, let's, these two things look very correlated. It's the width and the length of the petals. And it kind of makes sense. That means that some of those species, or some of those flowers have petals that are bigger, both in terms of width and length. So that's usually one thing I look for is like correlations between variables. And again, that plot is the same as that plot, just mirror. The other thing I would look for here is if there are any clusters of data, does it seem to be some underlying variable that can like explain what I'm seeing? For example, here, there's like one big cluster there, and then there's some small ones there, kind of the same trend in these ones. And since I know this data set, I can say that, okay, I know there are three different species in it. Maybe it's a different species that have different attributes of their flowers and leaves, which would make sense. To do this, we can go back to our previous command. Oh. Uh, I think you've been answered. I was going to ask how do you plot by species. Yes, plot. excellent. Excellent question. Because <laughs> we'll, we'll show that right now. Uh, so what you do, if you want to show the different species in, say, different colors, uh, you can simply give it an argument to say that I want to change the color hue by species. So if you say the hue equals the species, We'll think a bit, and then it'll actually color them. Oops, sorry. There. It'll actually color the observation by species. It'll give you a little bit of a nice legend there in the end that says which species these different colors belong to. Uh, and everyone's typed that in. If we go down and we look at the same relationship we looked at before, you can see that the variation within the petals of the, the flowers is very much dependent on which species it is. Because the different colors cluster together. OK, so that was just an overview of how data analysis looks in Python. We went from reading in a file, we did some kind of operations, calculated the mean and things, and then we plotted, plotted a result. And as we said before, this is all in your notebook. If I want to save this, or, sorry, it's saved automatically. If I want to share this with someone, if there's someone that uses Python already, I can send them the notebook file. If I want to send it to my supervisor, who maybe doesn't want to install Python because he's busy or she's busy and have other things to do, uh, I can go to export notebook as PDF and or export notebook as something else, HTML, and we look into that PDF issue afterwards. Yes? Uh, do you just want to export just the figures that you can then manipulate, say, an illustrator or something? Yeah. Uh, we'll show later how you can save a specific figure. One thing would be just to right-click the figure now. But if you want to do illustrator or something, we'll go through how to save them as like PDFs or other vector formats. Uh, I just wanted to show, yes, if you open this one. No. There's one. Yeah, okay, that's the thing we did in the beginning. Uh, da, 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 da. And then the, the formatting in the PDF is a little bit different than the HTML, but it's largely the same. And you keep everything is here. The notes we had were in the beginning. You get your graphs here. And uh, yeah, it's just an uh, easy way to share and send this PDF to wherever you want. OK, so this was a brief introduction to what Python is. How do you talk to computers? Uh, how do you use the notebook environment, which is what we use for exploratory data analysis? We will have a short break now for 15. Maybe we'll have a break until 10.50, so 17 minutes. And then afterwards, we'll talk about um, kind of concepts around data and how to store your data in a clean way and how to use uh, spreadsheets that when you need to use them, like for recording data and things like that, you use them in a way so it's really easy to get into this step afterwards. Uh, but we'll get into that in a bit. So if there's a break now, please come back at 10.50. There are now before lunch. And uh, we're just going to talk a little bit about, about like best practices around spreadsheets and around getting your data in a format initially that makes it easy to do analysis of it afterwards. I'll also mention some of the common pitfalls of why we don't recommend using spreadsheets. Uh, and what exactly we recommend using spreadsheets for. Um, yeah, so as I mentioned, in, you'll have, well, oh, sorry, I should do this. So this is just an overview of what we'll do. As I mentioned, uh, we'll look at some of the most common uh, common errors that you people do. Uh, da, 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 da. And then what formats you can actually store your data in for it to be uh, more efficiently. It's going to be a plain text format. <laughs>
What we will not teach you is these things because those will do in Python. Uh, some some people do like. Sometimes when you do do this, these things in spreadsheets, there are various caveats, and we'll go through them, and we'll tell you why this is not always a great idea. In essence, it's the same thing we just said, that it's easier to have reproducible analysis if you have this recipe and code of exactly what you did, rather than you went through and you clicked some things, and maybe you don't remember exactly what you clicked if you don't do it like for a while, and then when you're down the road, you want to do it again. Uh, however, spreadsheets are still good for some things, like, for example, data entry. Uh, and maybe I should check how many people here work with spreadsheets for data entry. Like, you don't have a machine that spits out the results. You actually you sit and record something yourself. So that's a lot of you. Okay. So that's a good use of spreadsheets. Because you could, of course, type them into, um, type them into uh, uh, just plain text file. But it's kind of nice to have those different columns set up for you already. And it makes it easy to to do data entry effectively. Uh, so we kind of been through that. As kind of as we mentioned already, if you want to then do some kind of tables for publications, etc., it can be tricky to do it in a spreadsheet. And if you want to do it again for another data set, you kind of have to go through that manual process again and create the exact same table. And it's also more error prone this way because you might accidentally like apply a slightly different formula to the cell cell next to the current cell or something, and you don't really realize because there's no error because it's still a valid formula. You just see that result there, and that way you could actually end up working with uh, results that are not what you think they are. We'll also go through a bit that when you do data entry, how can you ensure that your data is entered in a way uh, that you actually want it to be entered. So it's called quality assurance or quality control. And there's how do you validate the data when you enter it? This will be, there will be some parts that are code along, we'll work with spreadsheets, but mostly it'll be kind of like going through some things and I'll show some figures on the screen and uh, we'll more talk about the, the general concepts of working with spreadsheets. So one of the most common mistakes when you work with spreadsheets, it's that you kind of, you treat it like a lab notebook. So you have your data, and together with your data, you have maybe first you do your data in some kind of spatial layout that makes sense to you, but wouldn't make sense to a computer if you try to read it into a program to a program language. And likewise, maybe you use things like formatting for highlights. That might be fine if you're doing it solely for the purpose of a visual presentation for yourself, and you have your raw data somewhere else. But if you're using you know, you have your raw data and then you start, okay, I'm gonna mark all the values that are uh, over this limit with yellow or something. Of course, that will not carry over when we're reading this data into Python or R or some other programming language. So it's a good idea to, to store your data in a way that's easily interpretable by the computer, uh, either instead of or in addition to interpret, easily interpretable for, the, for, the, uh, for humans. Uh, yeah, so we'll go through how you can set up a well-formatted table already from the outset, uh, and that will prevent you already from like before you start entering data. Uh, it will make sure that everything will go correctly uh, once you start entering data. And another uh, common thing that's a good recommendation is that if you want something for visual display, you can make a new tab in your spreadsheet where you have like the data how, it sh how you like looking at it, but you still have the raw data in a separate file or in a separate tab. And if you want to take notes to yourself, if you would make them as a comment in the spreadsheet, okay, I'm going to use Google Sheets because uh, that's, I don't have Excel installed. I could use LibreOffice, but I'm not going to do it now. If you want to make a comment to yourself in the spreadsheet, if I do it like, um, okay, should maybe make this bigger. Maybe not that big. If you go to insert, comment. And if I type something here, OK, that's going to work for this specific spreadsheet program. It might or might not work for other spreadsheet programs. It might or might not work for other um, versions of the same spreadsheet program. And it will definitely not work if you're importing this data into uh, like Python or R. So if I make a comment on one of these values and I say, like, OK, there's a missing value here, then like that doesn't make any sense for the computer. Instead, you should take your notes in a separate tabs 
in a separate tab and you should have a special annotation for missing values. So just an example of how that can look like. Uh, you would create like a dedicated tab for notes and you would say that, okay, at this specific date, I did this op op operations and here I did this and then I did that. And you would keep kind of like, if you want a lab notebook, this is how you would keep it. You would not have it on top of your data as well. And this next part, uh, I think is super important if we scroll down. So these rules for how you want to record your data carry over to whatever program you use to work with data. So let's make them even bigger. And highlight. The first thing is that you want to put your variables in the columns. And what we mean by that is if I look at this, for example, um, here you have like you have the site that's a variable, but then you have 1999 and 2000, and then you just have these values are these are the same values. There's both values for the number of cases, but they're in two different columns. I want this number of cases to be in the same column. So how I should format this should be that my variable here, which is here in the columns, should actually be, sorry in a row should be in a separate column, and that column should be called year. My cases should be in a separate column that's called cases. So that's one to the right is to the right is one. The, var the variables are one per column, and then each row here is one observation. Here, it's this might still be a good format for display in some specific circumstances, but it's not an easy format to work with for many of the uh, different data analysis packages that we will go through. So that's the two for first points here, and those are the two uh, most important points, I think. Variables in columns, one observation per row. One observation per row. Um, this is a similar thing. Don't combine multiple pieces of information. And there's an example of that here, where they say, instead of making separate columns for species and sex, they have the same column where they record the species of the animal and the sex of the animal. This. So maybe this example seems contrived, but actually I, I have seen this often when people use some kind of ID for things. That's a combination of different variables. Maybe that can be okay in some circumstances. In general, one variable per column. So split this up in two columns, which I think they did here for species and sex. Go back up. This I already mentioned to you. Uh, if you, 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 you do want to have your raw data, as is, don't touch it. Because you want to go, be able to go back to it. If you do something that you regret later and you haven't saved your raw data, you have to redo that experiment. And this is what we'll go through in the end, is that kind of as I mentioned in the beginning, it's not a great idea to store your raw data in a binary format unless maybe it's very large data and you have to use a binary format to save it in a... Um, to save space. Otherwise, have a text-based format like a CSV file, which is simply value separated by commas, as we saw earlier. And I closed. Uh, because you will guarantee that any application can work with that file down the, like, um, down the road. Do, do, do. So the data set we'll work with, we'll kind of go into details later, but uh, I'll mention briefly, I can pull up here also. It's part of a kind of a, a it's a specific data set for teaching, but it's also been used in several publications. And the only difference between the data set we use is that they have cleaned it a bit from the pub published data set. Uh, and it's a data about um, small mammals in the desert in Arizona, and they have kind of had these different types of traps to collect animals, and then they measure them, they record the species, sex, uh, weight, and uh, the length of their feet and things like that, and then they release them back again. And as you can see, this is a very well-sided data set, so it's kind of cool that we're actually working with a real data set and not just some um, example data sets. But we will work with some example data sets also, so we'll do a little bit of both. Okay. 
So we'll do one exercise. I'm just gonna find it, Let's find it. Actually, instead of you downloading the data now, because we'll do it later, I'll pull up the data here. So this is, let's see if you can see it. Okay, so just for it to be a little bit more interactive, uh, this is the data set, um, a version of that data that I mentioned from the, from the collection of mammals in the desert. They're for two different years here, and you can ignore those two last columns. So there are two different people that have collected this data set for two different years. So in 2013, it was like one trainee, and then they had another trainee collect it the next year. Based on what we just discussed, take five minutes, turn to your neighbor, and say, uh, come up with two to three things that you think is wrong about how this data has been collected and how it could be improved. So if you turn like on a table base, we'll have pretty much two people talking to each other. Yes. Uh, some ideas, how would you have collected this data based on what we just talked about, or new ideas so that it could be more efficient uh, for your downstream ana analysis. So we'll do that until 11 p.m., 11, 11, something like that. And then we'll, like, you can brainstorm some ideas. But yeah, turn to your neighbor and talk. <laughs> yeah, sorry. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Oh, I see what you're saying. Oh, okay. <laughs> 
Okay. So let's uh, let's hear some ideas. Does any group want to start? Say something that yeah, go ahead. Could be improved. Yeah, we should probably uh, group all the data into one one sheet because yes. it's about thirteen thousand fourteen. So and then make a separate column for the years that I can analyze better. Um, what was that? Make a separate column for the like uh, for the years so that you can analyze it better. It's like separate like separate sheets. Yeah. Yeah. Two thousand thirteen. Uh, bring these three columns into one. These three okay. tables? Yeah, yeah. Make a column for the species. Yeah. Instead of having these three boxes, right? Yes, exactly. Uh, and okay, wait. Uh, we're going to have other groups also. That's great. That was many, many things. Really good. Any other group? Yeah, in the back. Um, for the weight, uh, I don't know if you need the units uh, in each, for each. Yes. They should be in the same unit anyway, so just. Yeah, that's a great point. Either specify it in the column, as you said, or have a separate column, which has like, wait, you can have that as well. More things? Yeah? These spaces should probably be in any address or something. Yeah. Be interpreted as like an empty string. Yeah, so this is, uh, blank is actually not that bad of a thing to have for missing values. But uh, what you said is, uh, is the one caveat that you could have with it. So alternatives are NAs, or you, but NAs, the problem is that uh, I think we see that here somewhere. The pro, okay, the, in another part of this data set, one of the variables, like the species abbreviation, is actually NA. So it could be a problem like that. <laughs> um, so you might just want to leave it blank. The issue there is that you don't know if you're actually missing that value or if you did something wrong when you were uh, entering the information. There's no perfect solution or that I can think of, uh, at least. Um, okay, yeah. Uh, we were thinking data collection is an underline to connect them, so it's machine readable. Yes, that's a great point. We'll talk about that more um, soon. Column names, like this makes sense for us to have a space in the column, but it could be problems when you're doing it in a programming interface because spaces actually have a meaning there. And usually it's like when you do a space, it's the next argument coming. And if you want to have one name, you need to surround it by quotes or something. So it's much easier to rewrite this as uh, they collected or something like that. More ideas? OK, then we'll go through some of the most. So you already mentioned some of this, so I will not spend time on all of them. The first most obvious thing is you shouldn't have multiple tables. That makes sense to you. Doesn't make that if I read this into pandas, uh, it will throw an error because that just doesn't work. Other thing you also mentioned already, if you have several tabs, it's it could work because there are arguments you can specify, but it's much easier if you have those in separate um, uh, documents, files. And uh, one more thing that we didn't say is that apart from missing values, it's important to fill in the zeros. Because if you have blanks as missing values, and you also use blank as zero, you don't know if you actually recorded the measurement that was zero, or if there was no measurement recorded. And those are very different things. This is, this is a little bit to, to your point. There are different values you can use for uh, when a value is missing. Usually blank is considered the best option. Uh, I will give the link to this, so you can study some of the alternatives later if you want to, but I, I won't go through every single one. One thing we didn't mention, because it wasn't part of this specific spreadsheet, sorry. Uh, it wasn't part of this, but here we go. If you use formatting, you kind of mentioned it before, if you use formatting to uh, convey information, that will, again, not be interpreted by the machine. So if I say, If I use this yellow highlighting to say that this measure device was not calibrated, 
Uh, what I should do instead is to have a separate column that says, was my measured device calibrated or not, yes or no? And that I can actually do analysis on. The other thing is just to, for me, this is just a caution not to do a lot of merging of cells and things because that can also mess, mess up uh, when you read it in programmatically because it's expecting like one comma and then one value. If you start merging values, there'll be another type of data format. Uh, so not super important. We already mentioned this. You should have one column for each variable. And this is what you just mentioned that uh, instead of writing something like maximum temperature, then you have a special uh, like sup uh, what's called upper not super script O or temperature symbol, and then like parentheses and things like that. Just write your name with underscores, and preferably also uh, lowercase. It's kind of up to you if you want to use lowercase or uppercase. I prefer doing like simple lowercase names, and if I have to uh, do something like string two words together, I use an underscore. Um, last thing, I mean, yeah, don't use special characters. This is important. So if you want to include metadata, this should be, as uh, again, a separate document that's your metadata. That's things like your notes and other data about the data you have been collected. It should not be put into comments or into like formatting uh, um, that makes sense visually. And that's it for the most common things. We'll come back to dates that you mentioned and talk a little bit specifically about it in, the, uh, in this next um, part. So dates can actually be stored in a spreadsheet in many, many different ways. And some of them are shown in the screenshot. So if you type in something like this, you can choose between all these different date formats. And, but internally for the computer, it's actually stored as, yes, the whole number. And this whole number is, as you can see here, in the case of Excel, this specific version of Excel they used to create this lecture, this number is essentially like a count up since uh, 1899, the last day of that year, and that you're gonna have just an integer number, and you can see that if you would do 1st of January 19, that's number one. So that's how the spreadsheet stores it internally. Sometimes when you export the date, this means that it will actually convert it to that integer number, and all your dates in your text format will now be, uh, will now be like 41,000 or 10,000 or something like that. What's a good thing to do instead is to kind of break it up. And although this might make, like, it seems like this makes sense. Uh, instead, if you break it up into three columns, that's like year, month, and day, uh, that'll be easy. And it will be easier to interpret for programming languages. And you're sure that there will be no formatting done on that so that it actually changes when you export the data. And I thought I would show that uh, briefly. So if you go, if I go to this date tab, dates tab, um, in Google Sheets and also in Excel, and I think in LibreOffice Calc, you, you actually have functions to extract uh, the year, the month, and the day <laughs> from a date. So maybe you want to keep the dates just to, for you, but you should also add these other columns. So I'll just go through how to do this. You can try. You can try it in your spreadsheet also if you want. That's up to you. If you type something like start C, it doesn't get bigger. It just says year here. So like as you do an operation of, on a cell, you say equals year, and then you say the number of the cell that you want to extract the year from. When you press enter, it'll actually extract that year for you. So you, if you make three columns like this, you make one for make like that month and day. Here, same thing here, equals month and equals day. This will always stay like that. And you don't have to worry about the computer somehow making a mess out of your date. The same thing goes the other way around. When you have something that's not the date, make sure it's not formatted as a date. There's a paper published on, on um, two G names, DEC1, December 1, OCT4, Oct4, October 4, uh, that were excluded because they, when this data was imported into Excel, it was converted into date format, and then when it was exported into a text file from there, it became just um, either an incorrect string or a number, I can't remember, but it, didn't, it wasn't a G name anymore. 
So these researchers who were looking at these important genes, they actually missed at least two of them because of how the formal thing was done in their specialty program. And you want to avoid that. You don't want to have to like retract your science because I didn't format my data correctly. Although that's an extreme example, it does happen. And especially if you work with things like three letter abbreviations that maybe many people do, uh, it can happen a lot. Uh, another way, to, another way to store dates. Acceptable uh, if we can find it. It's what's called the ISO 8601 format. And I'll just mention briefly how this looks. This way, you have to make sure that Excel doesn't format this column. But if you store it for just a date like that and in plain text, or if you have a time, you add that T thing. This is something that many data analysis programs can still interpret. And you can say that, OK, that's a date. And they'll understand what kind of data it is. And this is an the ISO thing. It's an like, agreed upon international standard for how to specify dates as one string of characters. Again, I like having separate columns, but this also works. Uh, what should we do next? Okay, now we'll get into something that's called quality control, as I mentioned in the beginning. And this is essentially to uh, help preventing errors as you enter in data, or once you've entered data, you can see if there are errors in that data. Uh, again, I'll use Google Sheets just because that's what I have installed. And uh, if you want, you can open up a spreadsheets program and try to look for these functions. I know you don't have the specific file, but it's more to get an idea of where you can find um, the function that I show you in your spreadsheet program. So for example, say that uh, in this column, I'm entering weights of animals. And I know that these weights are going to be between 0 or, say, 1,000 grams, because those are the species I'm studying. Then I could do something like I could mark this column, and I can go to, uh, if I remember where to go, data, and you go to data validation. And I think it's very similar in Excel. I think it's a button in the ribbon that says data validation. Actually, I can just, but since Excel is the most used thing, I'm going to show you how that looks. So it should look something like that in your Excel ribbon. Data, data validation, go back to Google Sheets. You're going to get some kind of menu like this where it can say that, OK, what, how do you want to validate this data? So I want to, as I said, I want this to be a number. And I know it's going to between, be between 0 and 1,000 grams. And you can choose to either show a warning or reject input. I'll start by doing reject input there. If you, I'll do that later. And you can say save. So now, if I enter a value that's between these two numbers, uh, there will be no warnings. Like if I enter 50, press enter, it works fine. If I, by accident, want to enter like 150, but I typed the minus sign before, and I try to press enter now, you get a message to say, the data you're trying to enter actually violates this data validation uh, function that you've set up. And that's great, because otherwise, maybe you would have entered that. And in the case of minus, OK, maybe you'll find that later, and you'll see that that makes sense. But if you entered like uh, something else, it might not always be obvious that that was an error that you made on the data input. So it's really good to set up these rules to validate as you type. Uh, and say I want to evaluate a text column. This is the sex of the animal. Uh, and I want to make sure that, OK, it can only be male and female in this case. Um, it, again, I go to data, data, data validation. And I say that, OK, a list of items it says enter items separated by a comma. OK, this should only be male or female. Uh, and I can say, again, we do reject input. And you can even write uh, help text like, Sex of animal can only be male or female or something. Say save. And now it's really nice because you get this drop down menu. And if I double click, I can see there are only two values I can enter. Same thing if I click this, this thing. 
gives me the two values I can enter. If I try to enter somewhere else, something else, it's you can and you can spec. This is the help text that you specified. So if you're working with someone else on data entry, uh, we actually did a project once for. Uh, well, it doesn't matter who it was for, but it was essentially an organization that's collecting info on all this medical equipment, and it was a mess because there's very many ways to express the same medical equipment. Uh, so they, like the analogy here would be that instead of male, some people would write like boy, and some people would write girl instead of female. And when it were complicated medical names, it would be all these misspellings and everything. And when we were trying to do data analysis on this initially, it, it was just really bothersome because we would have so many more different groups of things than there actually were because of the misspelling and the different names used. So essentially what we implemented for them was that we did, uh, we in that case, we just set up a Google Docs. And since that's how they were collecting data at the time. And we, we had a list of things in another document that were valid names. And when you start typing in one of these boxes, it will automatically put, pop up suggestions. That way, we made sure that there was only one name for one specific equipment. And that's something you can use for yourself as well to help when you're inputting data or you work with a summer student or something. Uh, let's take those out. Uh, just wanted to show the last thing, what happens if you do, if you do show warning instead. This is, I don't like this as much because it only gives you that little Rather thing for invalid. I like having the message pop up as I enter the thing so I know what I did wrong right away because I might miss this. Um, those are ways of preventing errors already before you enter something. Sometimes you're given a data set and you don't have control about who has entered it. Some things, we'll go through things you can do in Python to, to clean that data set a bit. But you can also do some things already in the spreadsheet. These are uh, more common things, so, so you might be familiar with them already. But I'm thinking about things that, OK, if I sort, sort my entire sheet by a column, like values that are missing, or say there would be text values in this numerical column, they would all kind of line up in the bottom. I can go and manually check those, see if it doesn't make sense, doesn't, doesn't, does not make sense. And do I do, need to delete some things? But much of this can also be done in, in Python. Another thing is that you can do conditional formatting and highlight like values that are really out of, out of the range that you expect them to be. OK, the last part, and then we maybe will have an early lunch. Yeah, that makes sense. We'll pull that. So the last part is about um, how to export your data and alternative formats that you can store it in, which we already mentioned a bit. So if you make this bigger, so you can see. So one of the reasons to not use um, formats like the Excel default, we only need to use the Excel default formats if you rely on formatting, which we have said is not a great way of doing things, uh, unless it's very specifically only for you visually. Uh, so instead, so if you use these formats. The, one of the disadvantages is that it's a proprietary format, so you have no control over what can happen to it. So it's completely up to Microsoft or whatever organization owns the format, what they want to do with it. And it used to be a problem before that things you did in an old version of Excel didn't work in a new version of Excel, or when you create your PowerPoint on Windows and you present on a Mac, you run into a lot of troubles. And you can prevent all this if you store your data in a, a text-based format that's completely open, so any program can read it. Uh, and there are no, no cryptic, like, bi so when I say binary, it means that uh, it's, it's not text. It's like some format that the company has designed. And you can't just view it and see what it is. They need to write a specification for how to work with that format. And if they don't, you have to guess or reverse engineer how to do it. Now some of the Excel things are actually XML formats, which are technically not binary, but zip files, but the general thing is the same thing. Uh, mentioned that, mentioned that. And yeah, this is a really important point. Um, many journals and grant agencies, like the people who will give you your money if you become a PI, uh, actually require you to use a plain text format anyways. So you might as well do it. And many official bodies, like uh, government in, and institutions like that, they already use text formats, especially for this uh, long-term viability thing. because 
when you're working in some businesses, uh, some sectors, it's common that maybe you store data and you need it to use it many, many years later, where whatever software you use to create it is obsolete. And then you want to have a format that's not dependent on that software. So even if you get around using like something for the four years you're in grad school, maybe two, three grad school students later, they want to use your data and you use this format that they can't open and you kind of like non-intentionally screw them over. So try not to do that. <laughs> uh, yes, yes, yes. Yeah, I think those are. So an example of a format like that is to just store it as text and either delimit it by tabs or delimit it by commas. A tab delimited file is called a CSV file, tab separated values, and the other one is comma separated values. And to go back to that iris file we used before, uh, as you can see, this is exactly that. So every name here is separated by a comma. And then there's a new name, and there's a comma, and the same thing about the uh, actual values in the data set. Any program can read this. It's super easy. It's just, OK, separate values by commas. There's uh, And of course, you can do this in your spreadsheet format. You can just go to File, uh, Save As, in my case, Download As. And Usually, both this or at least comma separate values are available. So you can just store your data in that format instead. And one thing that should be mentioned here if you're on Windows and you save, actually, I should show that image. If you're on Windows and you save your data as a CSV file, sometimes it will add this character, which means, if, like, if you have a line break, it will add that. And that's how. Uh, that's the text representation of a line break, so start up a new line. And the problem with that is that on, on Linux and Mac, it's, you, they're called Unix style endings. It's only the dash M. So sometimes if you open uh, such a CSV file, like if you open it to Windows, everything will look fine. But if you open it in another format, it can accidentally add these parts to it. Uh, so if you ever see that, you now know why that is. And the thing to the best way to get around it, if you can get that person to actually save it as what's called a Windows comma separated CSV file, which makes sure it's um, cross-platform compatible. There are some other ways also. Uh, if you ever end up using Git uh, for, for um, storing your data, Git is a great version control system. So it keeps versions of your data or your code or your text documents, anything you want. There are things there you can do to always remove these R's. And there are also to dedicated tools, which will not go into details. But if you ever encounter a file like that, it can be good to know that there are tools that can help you to actually convert all those right away. Uh, and I should also say that although Python sometimes can, Python or R, as in this example, can sometimes work with XLS file endings, like you save your XLS worksheet, you can read it in. For example, we saw earlier, uh, if we go back here, Say PD, well, you don't have to do this. Actually, see that there is something called PD read Excel. I could use this with an Excel file, with a binary file, but it's not guaranteed that it will work as well, and it's not, it's not guaranteed it will work as well across different platforms. So if I'm, I'm on uh, Unix, either Mac or Linux, and I use this, I might get a different result, or it might not work the same way as when you're using it on, on the Windows platform. So it's better to keep into plain text formats that everyone can use. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. One last caveat, and maybe we'll have an early launch after. Um, in some data, set, data sets, you'll actually have a comma as a real value in the data set. And there, then that's a good example. For example, for example, if you would use European annotation for decimal places, you would use a comma there. And then you would have some way to distinguish that comma from the comma that separates two columns. And one way could be to use, for example, tab to separate columns then. So you actually say there's a tab, tab separated file, and the commas indicate decimal positions instead. Or you can use quotes around your actual values. But and all those are things to keep in mind. And if that's your case, it's easy to look up in your software how, how to do that. 
Uh, but I would tend to use tap separated values in that case. So I think that's it before lunch. Do you have any general announcements, my dude? I would. Are there any questions? I mean, this maybe is more straightforward for many of you because you have worked with data before, just not in the programming context. After lunch, we'll get more into like basic Python things and explain in detail many of the things I was doing before. And we'll also get into working more with data. And Francis will be having that lecture. So we're there waving. <laughs> um, if there are not any questions right now, Okay, you can go to lunch. Please be, should we be back earlier then? Uh, yeah, does anyone have, uh, anyone, anyone not be able to come back to 12 30? That works for those existing lunch situations, then come back at 12 30. Not really know, I'm sorry, come on. Yeah, okay, cool. Everyone be back at 12 30, and maybe we'll be able to end a little bit earlier so people can go home early. If you have any questions, just ask me. Thanks, guys.